I'd like to say welcome to Cindy. And it was, yeah, it was my, I put her up to this. <laughs> so, um, so I was talking to Cindy about courseware and how she uses it and, and, and uh, what's been formative um, and things she'd like to see in the future and how the course has changed sort of big picture. And in that conversation, she mentioned to me that an educational symposium last summer, I think it was, she did this presentation to other educators about her experiences switching um, from a textbook, so dropping a textbook and, and moving towards uh, interactive visuals using visible body. And you know, she talked to me about her story, and I thought that story was very interesting, and I thought it was a story that um, the sales team and the education team here that do so much outreach to other instructors would be interested in hearing and learning from. Um, and so she sent me her slides and uh, we talked more and she said she was willing to join us and, and that this would take like a, maybe a, it's like a 20, 30 minute presentation and then there's Q and A. Um, yeah. And that's, that's about it for my intro. So I'd say, take it away, Cindy. Okay. So um, basically this presentation was originally given to a group in Minnesota that is looking at the use of technology in education. Um, and then I kind of, I, I went through and updated some data and I think you guys are really going to like what you see. Um, but I'm going to start with kind of my background to, um, you know, where, where I came at this from an educator, because I think that's a, a valid perspective. Originally, when, um, you know, as, as educators, when we think about materials and we think about the use of textbooks in a classroom, we kind of think about something like this. What you'll see is that the students are actually actively engaged with their textbooks. Um, they're reading them or they're interacting with the instructor with their textbook in front of them. And it's this like beautiful resource that they're constantly using. And this is how a lot of your educators kind of grew up. Um, and what we experienced in, in our education. Um, and now what we see is actually something really different. What we see is much more like this. Um, so here you've got a bunch of students, they're all on their laptops now. And I can almost guarantee if you sit in the back row that you would notice that a good 50% of them are on Facebook and about the other, you know, another 45% are probably like surfing the web in some other way. So um, this has been something that's gone from people hoping from hoping that students would be like looking at their slides and absorbing that information and interacting with it and taking notes um, to now something that's actually decided to be a distraction especially when it moves in this direction so now you've got a bunch of students and they're all on their cell phones um, and this is sadly really really common so it's to a point now where a lot of instructors are barring students from having laptops or cell phones or tablets in the classroom and a lot of colleges are doing things like blocking the internet so that they can keep the students from using these devices while they're in the classroom because they're so I'm gonna put in finger quotes but you can't see me they're so distracting so let's think about the student and how the student grew up and it, rather than think about us as instructors and what we think is going on. And what you can notice is if I drop a line where the students were born, ha ha, now we're looking at by the time they were born, 50% of households had computers. And because of we're thinking predominantly about students that are going to college and whose families are able to afford that. I am guessing that this number would be higher in those families. By the time these students reach grade school, at least 75% of their houses have a computer. Now, this isn't counting cell phones and tablets, right? They might have those. This is just thinking about computers. When we look at search engines, there's been a huge change in our culture. From in 2002, about 55% of people used search engines. And now, 96% um, of the people between the ages of 18 and 29, and this is as of 2011, so this is even some old data, use search engines on the regular. So this has actually fundamentally changed how we interact with information because now instead of looking through a textbook and finding um, that reference, right? Now we're just Googling for it. And so we're not really interacting with those materials. And I think it's important to understand that search engines 
have been around and have been really used as long as most of the students. So this has changed K through 12 education and K through 12 is one of these markets that's very progressive. Um, universities, we tend to be really slow because we're old and we're not really educators, we're researchers. Um, so in K through 12 education, they've been moving more towards away from textbooks. And an example of this is the Go Open campaign, which started in 2016 through the Department of Education. And this campaign aims to have all schools switch to open access materials. And the, re the rationale is that textbooks are often out of date by the time they are published. They are really expensive. So going textbook free is a lot cheaper. And this actually helps to create equity in lower income districts that can't afford the new textbooks when they come out. So this has kind of led to now in, in my state, in Minnesota, 55% of schools are supplying students with a tablet or laptop for their studies. And this was as of 2016. Now um, the projection at least was about 75% is what they want for this year. So a lot, the majority of students are getting some kind of device to do their work on. 75% of students use a tablet for schoolwork and the others use computers. So you have about 100% using something digital. And now there's been a look into these textbook free initiatives to see basically what, what is it doing to student performance. And there are a couple cool examples of this. One of them um, is through Vail Unified School District, which was really underperforming. I think they're about 15% below the median. And then they started going with textbook free initiatives and all of a sudden they're 20% above the median. And it's within about four years, they've been able to make that massive turnaround. There's another movement called Beyond Textbooks that's noticed similar gains. So what this means for, sort of us as university educators is that most students have had computer or internet access since birth. Most students have used computers or tablets for their schoolwork since grade school. Students are more likely to use an internet search over a library or desk reference. In fact, a lot of them don't know how to use libraries and desk references because they've never had to for their schoolwork. And the thing I find most interesting is when I talk to my colleagues about textbooks, they say, oh, I want them to have the textbook as a desk reference. And then you kind of pause and you look at them and you say, well, when was the last time you used your textbook as a desk reference? And they look at you stunned and they can't give you an answer because we Google. <laughs> no, so um, this, is, this is not a useful thing. Um, so what this means is that now the university students that we have are experiencing learning in a very fundamentally different way than previous generations because they're experiencing learning in the absence of textbooks, which have kind of been this gold standard. My first year, I was tasked with starting an anatomy and physiology course and growing our anatomy and physiology program. And I started by looking for textbooks. I looked through about six different textbooks, um, probably the most major uh, or most common ones used in the field, and ended up picking one of those to, to use for my course. The one I picked, I picked because it was highly visual, and I knew that that was something my students would actually gravitate towards. And it had a lot of online interactive material, which um, would allow the students some sort of self-quizzing and, and all these sorts of things that um, are often boasted by publishers to produce massive learning gains. So at least the hope was that this was material that would be very easy for the students to use and that they would appreciate it. Um, and I was excited to use the additional sort of online adaptive learning product because of the express learning games. But then the reality set in, and the reality is that the book was really expensive. It was $174, and I think today it actually even costs more. Um, but I rationalize this by saying, well, it's used for two semesters, so really that's more like $90 a semester, and maybe that's more acceptable. And I need to say that they need to buy the book new so they have access to the online content. It's not a scenario where they can buy the book used. So that $174 price tag is actually $174.
another reality about the two semester course is that if the student fails one of the semesters, which is fairly common in anatomy and physiology, then they're out that money again. They have to pay it because their access to the online content from most publishers only lasts a year. Well, in reality, what happened is that less than 50% of my class adopted the use of the online content. And this was despite that it was actually the first uh, year that I did this embedded within their grade. And I um, confronted the students and I said, okay, you're getting credit for this and it's hurting your grade that you're not doing it. Why are you not doing it? And they said, it's just too expensive. And I moved it to extra credit and the adoption of the online content dropped precipitously um, because it was just too costly to the student. So you may wonder, what about the students who did use it? What did they think? And um, there, there were issues. The program crashed. It was difficult to use. Um, there were times it didn't record the student's work, which really made them quite unhappy. And from the instructor perspective, I saw, I saw two kind of major issues. One of them was that this particular program had a lot of uh, cadaver images and they were using it as sort of like a virtual cadaver lab. And the problem with taking pictures of cadavers is you're taking something that's 3D and turning it into 2D and it's a very highly processed tissue so it's very hard to see those layers when you're looking at a flat image. And so the students were just not able to identify things the way that they should have been able to. And it was partially because of the, the medium. Um, the other problem that I saw was that I had no ability to customize the questions that I was asking in the quizzes. For the company that I was using, their quiz customization is that you can pick quizzes from their quiz bank, and you can pick which quiz, quiz questions from their quiz bank that you want to use, but you can't write your own questions. And this to me presents a problem because I really find that many publisher pre-written quizzes are very myopic. They're in way too much detail and they're not really focused on understanding the material. It reads more like sort of trivia fun facts. And this created a big problem for my students because what they were experiencing in the online content was a set of questions that differed a lot from how I ask questions. And that mismatch made them feel like they were not really getting as much out of it. I really found it difficult on the instructor side to use, um, even in terms of setting up the quizzes, it was tedious. And the students weren't really getting a lot out of it, um, according to them kind of in, in general conversations. So at the end of my second semester, I did a survey and I had them rate the usefulness of the book on a Likert scale from five, which would be strongly agree, to one, strongly disagree. And the students rated the book as a 3.4 for usefulness. This means that the book is slightly better than neutral, um, which is decidedly kind of meh. When I had them rate the online content separately, they rated that online content as um, or in combination with the online content as a 3.9, which is better than neutral, but remember it was only a very small number of the students that were actually doing this. And this rating was actually largely due to the quizzing functionality, and they felt that just kind of prepping themselves for those quizzes aided them in um, doing better in the course. So basically it was make, in motivating them to study a little bit more. When I looked at the student criticisms of the material, the comments that they're making were that the assignments from the online content were off, meaning they were not related to my course as well, and they were in too much depth, so much more than I covered in my course. Um, and they complained that the book was so heavy that they weren't able to take it with them. It was not really a portable thing, and if you've seen most of the massively produced anatomy and physiology textbooks, most of them are these big, heavy sort of tomes that um, are not really 
portable and not all students can afford um, some sort of e-reader to put the more portable electronic version on. So there are issues there. Um, another issue which may be more apparent at my school, but I, I suspect happens elsewhere as well, is that if my student, who's paying nearly $200 for their textbook, takes one of the semesters of A&P with me, and then they go to a different school, if that different school is using a different book, they need to, again, pay $200 plus for access to that book's online content. So this becomes a really expensive prospect. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of students repeat this course. And when they repeat the course, they have to buy the material again because their access is only for two consecutive semesters. So if anything goes wrong, you get sick, you have to withdraw, um, you can't fit it in your schedule that semester, you are out again, 200 plus dollars. This led to a desire to do something different. Um, and I, I started kind of looking at what was on the market and around that time had a student that was really struggling. I mean, it looked like he was going to fail and we started talking and I said, well, you know, why don't you try this A and P program from visible body? I've been playing with it. I think it's really cool. You might like it too. And this student within that semester went from getting D's to getting B's. And it was so staggering that I sat down with him and I said, what, what are you doing? Are you studying? Did you get a tutor? And he said, no, this app, it's really helpful. And I always have it with me because I always have my cell phone with me and I can just take it everywhere. And whenever I've got downtime at work, I can, I can look at this app. So that was my aha moment. And this yet led to me moving into another semester of A&P saying, you know what, we're not going to use the textbook anymore. We're going to only use visible body. This was pre-courseware. So we had the students purchase the A&P app and Atlas. And they were scared. My students are average age between, I think they're average age about 30. So they're returning to school. A lot of them have families, jobs, everything. And they'll say, oh, I'm just not a technology person. And I was really worried, too, because I thought, well, if this flops, my colleagues were already kind of raising an eyebrow and saying, oh, you're, you're getting rid of your textbook. That's, that's a little scary. Um, and so I was kind of afraid of, of uh, looking poor in front of them while I was still pre-tenure and also that my, I would completely ruin a class. So I started reading about ebooks and the utility of ebooks. And there's what the publishers will tell you, which is okay, they cost students 50 to 70% less. And when you start to look at the student side of that, there are two different studies, and both of them say about the same thing. Um, the one in 2012 says 75% of students prefer hard copy books, and the one in 2013 says that. Um, about that many students find reading ebooks difficult, or actually they said 22.5 say that they don't find reading ebooks difficult. So they're difficult to read, students like the hard copy, so the price is lower, but they're not really seeing the value. And when you look at that, students report that when they have those online learning aids, they have higher scores than those who don't use them. But this could just be students that are doing their homework. Um, and are thus getting a higher score. Or it could be that the professors are giving a bonus to do these assignments, and as a result, the students are enjoying higher scores. In the end, it turns out the best predictor of success of students is how much time they spend engaging with their material. And so your goal as an educator is to get them engaged. So I started thinking, well, the visible body, okay, it's, it's not just this quizzing platform, it's not just an ebook, it's also VR. And what does VR do? 
And it turns out that virtual reality has shown incredible gains in self-efficacy. So this is um, the student's ability to direct their learning. And if you think about a student clicking through the A and P app, one of the things that they're going to do is when they have a question, they'll be able to click on that item and learn a little bit more about it. So they answer their questions as they have them, where with a textbook, they'd have to go a couple more pages in to find their answer. They might have to wait a while. It gives them procedural knowledge um, in terms of if we think of uh, orders of things, if you're thinking of dissecting a structure invisible body, now we can think about what's on the outside versus the inside. And that would be sort of a procedural thing. Um, their retention is much higher. So really great learning gains in this study. I'm trying to remember the type of VR that they used in this classroom. I think it was for um, a psychology class, but I was hoping to see those similar gains. So I knew that this was a risk. I knew that eBooks are not normally successful from the eyes of the student, even though universities are pushing them more because universities want us to bring cost down to students. My students as a population are really technology averse. They're a little bit older. They are from predominantly low income families. So they haven't been around technology quite as much. Um, so they're, they, they were really wary. Um, and at this time, again, courseware didn't exist yet. Um, and when we adopted courseware, that was another risk because courseware was really in its infancy. We were a beta test site. So there was a little bit of fear about, oh my goodness, how is this going to work? And, and what if it doesn't work? But I knew if it worked that I could save the students money. And one of the things that I had been actively trying to do before this switch is I was actively trying to stop teaching anatomy and physiology because I hated it. Um, and I, I was just looking for something else to do. And I was like, I can't, I couldn't engage with the material. Before Visible Body, this is what our data looked like. Um, students never mentioned anything good about their textbook. In fact, everything they mentioned was usually pretty bad. Um, I had varying amounts of withdrawals. Um, the highest was my first semester. Almost 28% of my students withdrew um, by... If we look at aggregate data over three semesters, 18.4% of students withdraw. The students who received a D or an F, um, if we look again at the aggregate, because it's a little bit volatile, um, you see 16.9% of students that are getting a D or an F. And by the way, um, well, I'll get to it, but this is a lower number than most people. It's not just that I'm a big jerk. Um, <laughs> when we look at the aggregate data, 10.7% of students get A's, 26% get B's, and 27.7% get C's. What this means, and what I want to hone you in on, is what we call the DFW rate. So these are students that withdraw, get a D or a W, and this means that they paid for the course, but they received no credit. In my case, it was 35.3% of the students. And I am, this is not that I'm a big jerk or anything like that. Um, the national average is actually 50%. So at 35%, I was actually doing, believe it or not, good. I was horrified. <laughs> so when I look at this aggregate data next to the switch to visible body, I want you to see a couple things. One of those is looking at the students feeling that the material was helpful to their learning. The students go on that Likert scale from between neutral and agree to between agree and strongly agree with visible body. So they agree that it is helpful, and a lot of them think it's really helpful. 50% of the students unprompted mention that they love visible body. When I ask them if they feel that the materials that they're using are worth the cost, and this is basically me looking at an open open stacks textbook type situation, um, instead of using a &P, the student said, no, we actually are willing to pay for this because we like it. So that 4.5 means that they agree that it's worth the cost. My withdrawal rates dropped by 10%. And my students that received a D or an F dropped precipitously as well. Now you'll notice I've got a number there in parentheses. Um, that semester I had students that were cheating and as a result gave them Fs. And I kind of felt like I needed to take them out of the data set because their grade was not due to their performance in the class. It was sort of due to other things that were going on. So 
um, if we remove the cheaters, we get to a point where my DNF rate is 50% of what it was. Um, along with that, I saw a 10% rise in my A's, um, a about 8% rise in my B's, and a 6% decrease in C's. So what this means is that those DNF students are moving up to C's the C's are moving up to B's and a lot of those B's are moving into that or C's are moving to B's and a lot of the B's are moving into that A range. So now we're getting a much more even distribution. <laughs> so now what I want to do is show you that this was not a fluke. So this is the fear, right? You see something really good and then you say, okay, is this, is this going to continue or is this um, just this particular semester? And what I've noticed is that it's continued. Students are still really happy with visible body. They love it. They still, about 50%, mention um, things about visible body in their course evaluations, which, by the way, are not prompted. And I have to say, I, I talked to a bunch of colleagues when I was kind of updating this, and I was like, so how many times have your students positively mentioned the book that you use in their course evaluations? And they all said, I've never had that happen. So this is something you're doing better than anybody else, as far as I can tell. And this wasn't just a &P colleagues. This was colleagues across the sciences. Um, my students who withdrew has, um, it's still a little bit volatile, but it's never gotten back up to that 18%. And here in semester two, I've got another number in parentheses. I had a bunch of students withdraw who were actually doing well in the course and they withdrew due to personal circumstances. Um, one of them found out that they were really ill. One of them had shingles in their eye and lost the ability to, to see reliably during the semester. One lost a parent. Um, so it's things like that, that I had a couple students withdraw from. And if we kind of take those out of the pool, um, we can see that it's this precipitous drop in withdrawal rate. When we look at those D's and F's, again, that has stayed pretty low. This last semester, my 14.28s, I will admit that they were a little weaker coming in, and they didn't really start using visible body until after the first exam. Um, and that was because their, their lovely instructor gave them a talking to um, because they half of them failed my first exam. When I look at... Um, the other grades, the A, Bs, and Cs, I still am maintaining more As, um, and for the most part, maintaining more Bs and fewer Cs, which is really great. You're, it's to me very staggering. So um, again, I look at students who withdrew dropping precipitously, students getting a D or F dropping precipitously, more As, more Bs, and fewer Cs. And we're going to hone back in on this number, that DFW rate. Remember that I told you the national average for DFW for ANP is 50%. I'm down to 24.5% when I remove the cheaters and remove those students that had pretty major life circumstance happen to them and got basically the university withdrew and erased it from their record because their circumstances were so dire. We're from 35.3% DFW down to 19.2%. Nobody has that. So I asked them about courseware. And, um, and I've, I've talked a little bit about some of the, there, there are issues with courseware and I'm really excited about the next version coming out. Um, but one of the things the students said is they said, the quizzes keep me on track. And this is between strongly agree and agree. When I assigned the quizzes, this last semester, I did not assign the quizzes. And I just said, oh, they're there for you to practice. And the students were a little bit more neutral because they weren't, a lot of them weren't actively participating with those quizzes because they weren't assigned. So that's something to tell instructors that it, it works a little bit better when those quizzes are assigned. When I look at student comments, um, these are the kinds of things I see is put more visible body in your lecture. 50% of them saying that they like visible body. Um, they say it's an amazing resource, use it more. Um, one said, I recommend that future students use a and and Atlas and explore it, meaning that they, they thought that they really needed to engage with it and click around. Um, a lot of them say they like playing with visible body and play is another word that I have never heard used for any other course materials. The only one I remember using that for myself was there is an engineering class where you could make a bridge and you could make it really weak. 
so that your truck would crash through it. And I used to just crash trucks all the time. I wasn't actually in that engineering class. I just liked making <laughs> bad bridges. <laughs> so um, they recommend it. And my favorite comment of all time is they call it the Rosetta Stone for A&P. Um, so these are comments that most people never see. And I love that they're making these comments. And even now I'll see students from previous semesters and they'll say, I'm still using it. So what did I see? Um, I saw the students using the apps during tasks in class. So um, one of the things that I do is I'll have them, I'll be like, draw the heart and label it. And I have them do it. One of the rooms I teach in, the walls are all whiteboards. So I say, okay, go up to the wall in groups of two or three. Everybody's going to draw a heart and label it. And then you're going to go to your neighbors and you're going to correct. And this is something or we'll do vessels like that too. This is something that they'll take the apps up and they'll use the apps while they're doing it. Um, and that's really, really, really great for them. Some of them even take pictures from the apps and they'll put them, as they're taking notes on their computer, they'll put those pictures in their notes. The students share their course materials. They share visible body with family and friends and basically will pull the apps up and show them. And in more than one case, this has resulted in a family member or a friend buying this material. Um, and I had one student, mom was a radiology tech and her mom bought it for continuing education. Um, another one, their sibling bought it for the a and that they were taking in high school. Um, and I've had a couple that have bought it for their children. So this is something, again, you don't see with textbooks. Um, the students actually play with the apps and as they come up with questions, they'll try to figure out the answer using the app. And sometimes during class or lab, they'll even flag me down and they'll be like, okay, you know, I, I can see this here and I get what it's saying, but can you help me with this? And it's great to see them engaged with those apps. Um, they discuss the materials as being fun and interactive, and they're more able to review materials while they're out and about. And the modern student is really non-traditional. What we're seeing is a rise in students who are working and who are adults. And if you think about the working adult, and I think about my life, I have a four-year-old son who's actually here. He loves visible body. He calls it the muscle and bone game um, <laughs> and asks to play with it. <laughs> so... Um, there are times when I've only got a 15 minute window to look at something, but the way that the app is sort of split up, you can do it in these really small windows. And my original student was a boy, he did boiler maintenance and he said, you know, it's great when I'm draining the boiler, I've got this time to just like sit down and hang out because I've got to wait for it to drain and I can look at these apps. Um, so it's neat because it's actually portable. And if they've got an hour long bus drive to school, they can use it on their bus ride. Um, and that's something that, again, with a really heavy textbook, they're not going to be, you know, pulling it out during their lunch hour and reading it. And one of the things that that actually encourages is something in education that um, we call spaced learning. And spaced learning means you're taking smaller amounts of material and you're looking at it multiple times, as opposed to binge studying. And we know that spaced learning will be retained more than binge studying, where you study for like three hours straight. It's actually better to take those three hours and break them into 30 minute blocks. A kind of unexpected change for me was how I interact with the students. I gave up PowerPoint. And instead, what I do is I walk through the visible body models and I use the whiteboard. I also sometimes import pictures from visible body into Keynote. And I use my iPad to draw on the Keynote slide so that I can give students a little bit more information. Um, and they love this because then they see the utility of visible body and how to use it both in class and then they can do it on their own as well. Um, I have students again, that are now they're looking for structures, they're doing a little bit more diagramming structures because they have a reference. They don't have to do it from memory. They're not paging through a heavy book. I don't have to hope they brought their book with them. Um, it's really fun for me to make new materials and I have an absolute blast even making exams, which is bizarre. Um, and I also have been making tutorial videos using Visible Body and I'm gonna pull up one of these, hopefully it'll work. And I'm not going to show you the whole thing because it's, it's long. It's about 10 minutes. But in these tutorials, what I do is I use a program called Linnea as a whiteboard. And I'll write something. 
And then what I'll do is I'll kind of narrate and I'll go through the visible body models while narrating. And then I post these on our course management system so that my students can use them to just kind of help them with difficult topics. So this is the vessels and I just kind of walk through and say, okay, here are the layers of the vessels and this is what's going on in each layer. Then you've got a little capillary bed here um, and the capillaries are really, really small. And then you've got a vein. And because of what the different vessels do, they do have some structural differences. What, what I want to do first is start with the general anatomy of these vessels. Um, both the artery and the vein have this area around the outside called the tunica saturna, and it's the same name on the artery and on the vein. And it's the external most layer. There's a tunica media, again, on the artery and on the Yep. Oh, well, that's a good stopping point for us. <laughs> so you kind of get the idea um, of those videos, and that has been a very big change to my teaching. Um, because it's, it's allowing me to kind of pick topics that the students are struggling with and I actually ask them to nominate what they want a video about and then I can do those and then I've been using those in subsequent semesters so this year I did the vessels and it was okay we're going to talk through the arm vessels and sometimes I do flow charts and stuff it's it's really neat it's a different way of teaching what do I want to do in the future right one of the things that I did this year in the middle of the semester, it was one of the suggested videos from the students is they said, I just don't understand how to use these apps. And so I walked through, this is how you use them. And this is what I'm expecting. And I did that in one of my videos. And that's going to be available from now on from the start of the semester. Um, I am going to do more quizzing in courseware because apparently the students find it really useful. And I do think it's a really good thing to keep them on track. And um, I'm really excited about the changes in courseware. I really, 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 and I'm, this is the change I'm most scared about and I haven't decided how to do it, but I really want to start using courseware for the labeling portion of my exam because I have my students label a structure and it may be find ter or label Terry's major. And what you would normally do is you'd have a picture of all the shoulder muscles and Terry's major would just magically be visible. And it's so much more powerful to give the student a body where they have to figure out, to, they have to dissect down all the layers to find that one muscle, um, which is actually a much more realistic scenario, right? They're not just going to get a shoulder when they go to the clinic, they're, they're gonna have a whole person. Um, I have already used the new labeling function in Atlas during lecture and the students loved it with the exception of the fact that it's a little bit small when it's projected. Um, but that's really nice because then I don't have to, you saw my previous video where I added in those labels after the fact. Now I don't have to even do that anymore. And that's a really wonderful, beautiful thing. It makes me a little quicker. Um, I have... Uh, been incorporating more and more of the pathology videos. The students love them. And then what we'll do is we'll kind of show those and have a discussion about, well, why is this pathology present? And they get really into it. Um, and they, they love that it's visual instead of me saying, oh, this causes the patient to be short of breath. <laughs> they like to have a little bit more of a video with it. Um, and I have been working with our nursing program because my students are predominantly pre-nursing, talking to them about using these apps in the subsequent coursework of the students. And one of my kind of secret agendas is actually to have all the students when they're accepted to nursing issued an iPad that's loaded with the apps. Um, the pathophys instructor is the most excited <laughs> right now. And I think um, she'll pretty much do cartwheels when she gets to see that pathophys app. So my sort of conclusions for you um, is that switching to visible body as an instructor has not only increased student enjoyment, but also mine. Um, it's a lot more fun to do. And when people are excited and they're having fun, 
they're a lot more engaged. So when they're looking at the materials, they are more interactive. They're interacting with it more. They're engaged with it. They're actively acting, asking questions. Sometimes they even goof around with it. They'll draw googly eyes on the models or whatever. Um, it's made them more effective learners because I think it's sort of speaking to their understanding of technology and going to where they've been for a very long time. Um, and it's allowing them to answer questions as they have them and review things they don't understand. Um, I also think it helps that it's not as bulky as a textbook. A lot of textbooks read like the drunken end of a sabbatical. And you have, in a really wonderful way, kept the material very minimalistic, so it's very focused. And the students are benefiting from that. It's also made me more effective as an instructor they will come, the students will come to class prepared. We get to talk. I don't use PowerPoint slides, which I'm reading. I'm not boring anymore. Um, and the student ratings of me have increased. Um, and it's cost effective. I mean, what's there not to love about something that's 25% of the cost of a very heavy textbook that you will never use again. And I love that they get to keep it around as a reference for future courses. Yeah, and I, I have a lot of questions, but I, I get to talk to Cindy often, so I step back and, and see. Do we use the handshake, Emily, for people to ask questions? Or I'm unmuting everybody, but I'm, we've got one in the question. I think I'm unmuting people. Give it a second, yeah. Okay. See if Rachel's in. Give it a second. Hold on a second. There we go. Okay, so everybody is unmuted. Okay, and so we can, we can type our questions. I can type mine. And sure. Everyone. We've got one from Deb. So I'll start with Deb's. Um, Deb wrote, are you requiring the use of VB courseware for your course? Uh, why weren't students using VB before the first exam? So the first semester that we had access to courseware, it was required. Um, and the students were obviously using it because they had to. The second semester, I said it was required, and I looked at, and I, I just wasn't as engaged with it, and I admit to that, um, but I looked at it, and 50% of the students weren't using it at all, and I, I kind of had this point where I was like, I don't, I'm not going to require you I should have just kept pushing that it was required. And instead I said, oh, well, okay, if you're not using it, we're going to make it optional. And I backpedaled a little bit. But then after that first exam, I said, look, those of you who are not using this, this is how you're performing. And you need to wake up because you're probably going to fail this class. And um, that did increase engagement, but it really does need to be part of their grade. And I was hoping just to make it an optional thing. Part of that is that I switched to a different quizzing paradigm. I switched to what we like to call group quizzes, and I had them actively working in class on stuff. And I think I'm going to do both next time around. Did that answer your question? Yes, yeah, Cindy, this is Deb Varnado. And I uh, kind of a, a follow-up to that is I often hear instructors say, and I'm sure my colleagues do as well, that, oh, I just adopted, um, you know, a new textbook and we're going to have that for the next two years. So I can't require the use of visible body right now. I can just make it optional. So I think for us, it's really important that you know, we have these key talking points about engagement and, you know, the students enjoying it, obviously being very effective, not just for them, but from the instructor point of view. Um, how would you suggest that we try to overcome that objection when we know that our cost is less, but in the beginning, it would be an add-on cost as a supplemental resource? Yeah, um, you know, it's a tough one. And part of it, honestly, is instructor, instructor inertia. It does take time for them to get in and get their quizzes set up because I find when I write the quizzes that they're <laughs> surprised more like what I would write on an exam. Um, but I think that letting them know at least saying, well, what we have found is that, or instructors have told us whatever, however you want to put it, when 
it's not necessarily required as part of the student's grade, they don't always adopt it because it is an additional cost. Um, and I think that that can at least help. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't love, know. I love the data you showed about the decrease in the, the DFW because that's something that I think really resonates with them. Maybe, you know, maybe we can work with my and her team to come up with um, an email to kind of really specifically call out how, how visible body has a positive effect, um, you know, in those measures. Maite had a question. Maite, you want to ask it live about the DFW? Yeah, I was just rates. curious where you got that. Is that, is that from HAPS, that national 50% DWF rate? Uh, let's see, that was good question. It wasn't, you know, I actually, and I'll admit that this is my, my less than scientific manner mm -hmm. of getting that data. It was from an NPR story. <laughs> and oh. I, I had heard, I knew that mine was low, but there was a recent NPR story that was talking about that this is this is the weed out courses course for nurses basically and they were the ones that did the figure and i was like wow that's 50 percent. that's crazy yeah i'll look that up that's interesting that's an interesting stat to use yeah and i can't I even i was asking because i've heard it too from these instructors all the time it's that most people don't pursue the nursing career because they don't get past this course yeah so that, it's it's right. really common um and i was even told by nursing i contacted them when my failure rate was so high the first semester and they're like oh that's okay <laughs> 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 like, this is a terrible thing we're in a nursing shortage what are you talking about this is not okay. <laughs> um and i think people accept it as fact and it's not and I think you're losing a lot of really good students to just not having materials that work with them. So we, we did Maite's first question and then uh, Mary's question is next. So what would you recommend the easiest way? Oh, um, well, of course, see, I'm going to say this because it's my course, but I, I would say you should use the materials provided on courseware, the sample course. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I love about the sample course is the guided notes. And that's something my students love too, because they say, we know where you're going. And that has enabled me to go PowerPoint free, which in terms of prep has cut out a huge amount. Um, so I would, you know, try to say that the materials are, I, I like to think very usable. Um, one thing that can also help is if you put people in contact with instructors who are using it to kind of help, you know, you, like instructor ambassadors, basically, who can say, this is how you use it. And this is, um, you know, that basically, like, here are some little hints and tricks. Mm -hmm. And I think if you get that little instructor community going, it'll take a lot of the inertia out, because usually we want to start with a pre-made course. And most people, and I can tell you in my experience, instructor slides that publishers give you are useless. They're horrible. Mm -hmm. And the question was, uh, it was just that, what would you recommend as the easiest way for an instructor to start using visible body courseware with minimum pain and maximum benefits. So great question, Mary. Um, I, I have a practical question based on that. Why are they so terrible? Just so, so we know what we have to do. Usually they put way too much stuff on the slides. And so they basically take like a chunk of the textbook and they may put a figure next to it. And they'll give you these slide decks of like 150 slides for a 45 minute lecture. Yeah. And the most slides you should ever have. So I, I used to teach scientific communication. So I have, I have very <laughs> pronounced thoughts about this. The most slides you should ever have is a slide a minute. And I really think in general, when you're teaching, if you're teaching a 45 minute class, I think 15 slides. Yeah. You know, and what I try to do is just have pictures of the organs because the more you have and the more text you have, the more boring it is. 
and the more likely you are to read it just because that's a very natural response especially when you look at academics most of us are very introverted um and so we don't like standing in front of big classes and the, the natural thing to do is kind of turn towards your slides and pretend that the students don't exist and um I, the more slides you have and the more dense they are, the more easy it is to do that. So for me, one of the big things when I design a course is setting up defined learning outcomes and setting up objectives for each lecture. So those are my focal points. And when I looked at HAPS, I looked at the HAPS objectives, there are over 2,000 and it really freaked me out because <laughs> I was like, there's no way. I can't give you 2,000 things to learn. And if I do, you're going to remember like 700. Mm -hmm. So why don't I narrow it down and give you a deeper understanding of 800 things and at least make sure that you remember the 700 most embarrassing if you were to forget them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, Cindy, I already know what the next thing I'm going to book you for is. <laughs> <laughs> I, cause I think um, that... One one thing that we can do for instructors is help them. Like you said, that one thing that the APF does is is sort of take a minimalist approach to engage mm -hmm. students. And I think what you're saying about instructor materials is that they they shouldn't throw everything at you. They should give you a a solution for a 50 minute lecture. Exactly. And I think one thing that you don't do currently that I think would be helpful is, yes, I can go in and I can find the model and I can get it in the right orientation and I can take that picture um, so that I can incorporate it into my lecture. But it'd be really nice to have some canned slides because that can get really um, consuming. And if you were to look at my desktop right now, and the terrible thing is the last unit I taught is genitalia. So I've got all these like thumbnail pictures. Of <laughs> so would, would those be a keynote deck or would you want it like as an eventual tour in Atlas? Like what, what would be the, the way that you would like Ooh. that? Yeah, do you mean, Cindy, like you would want to have a place to store your images in courseware so you can add them or store them with an atlas? To, yeah, you know that would be really cool. This, this is the crazy thought is to have, to have a tour because more and more I've been teaching with the tours mm -hmm. um, because then I can just like queue up the stuff and I can be like, oh, we're going to talk about, you know, the kidney and where it is in the body and then we can kind of get increasingly granular. Um, and that's wonderful. If you could make some way, and you're going to lose the 3D, but I think when you're lecturing, you don't always use it, especially when you're just starting. Um, to make those tours exportable as like a PowerPoint in just like a plain image. So the you can't rotate the tour, but whatever that image is, if it can be exported as a PowerPoint, that would be huge. Okay, yeah, good idea. Okay, well, sorry, I didn't mean to derail. Yeah, that's we're, we're cool. Sorry. All right, well, it's 2.01. We just have um, uh, three quick questions, Cindy. Can we keep you for another, like, oh, two minutes? Oh, I'm, right. I'm on Twitter. <laughs> you can keep Great, it. thank you so much. Um, so Maite wrote, well, you can see them, so I can go ahead and try to read them to you. So why did I want to get out of teaching A&P? You know, I was not enjoying it. And I wasn't enjoying it because I felt like I was just reading Latin terms to students. And if you think about doing it with a textbook, you're showing them a picture and you're pointing your pointer at the different Latin terms and you're just walking through it. And then every now and then getting the function. And I just, it's such a boring way to teach. And I was like, I'm not a boring person, but I hate this. And... I now what I can do is I can click on stuff and I can be like, oh, this is here. And now when we go under that, and it's it's much more interactive than just having these static images. Um, so I was really frustrated with it and also frustrated with student performance, to be honest. It is really, really, really hard and heartbreaking when 35% of your class is not going to get credit for your course because they're doing so horrible. Mm -hmm. And I... And a lot of those students are, they're trying. It's not that they're not showing up to class. They're trying. They just, they just aren't succeeding. And that has been, that's heartbreaking for me. I have a really hard time internalizing that. 
I totally get that. Yeah. That's a struggle. It's hard to, yeah, it's yeah. disheartening. What I have found in switching to visible body, it used to take me on average about three hours to make a lecture pre-visible body and now I just zip through them because I've got my iPad next to me and I'm zipping through you know a and and looking at what's covered and I've got my guided notes printed out next to me and I've got my computer right in front of me and I know what I want to put on the slides and like I said now I'm slide free so now the prep is literally me sitting down and just kind of remembering what I want to say um, and one of my goals, because my, I have gotten a little blowback from students uh, about the lack of slides, um, is to, I was going to make keynote, really stripped down keynote slides, because then I can write on them. Um, but now with the writing function in Atlas, we're just going to use that. <laughs> have a really good time with it. I really love the product and the thing that sells me on it is really all of a sudden I've got these students succeeding and they are so engaged and they're so into asking questions and even about genitalia which by the way is so not the easiest unit to teach. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they get into it and I give them the the labs that have been written and I say oh you know if you're really struggling here's something for you. And it's like they have all these little guides. And so even I go to my rate, my professor, and it's like, she will give you everything you need to succeed. And that's, that's my goal. I'm, I'm never going to give you a grade you do not deserve. <laughs> but I will give you a path to get you where you need to go. Um, like, oh, and there's, right? like, that's the educator ideal. Like, good job. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I try. I try. Well, my, my dean, actually, he says that I am the the model for what he wishes everybody would do. And I was like, well, you know, we're standing in my class, but thank you. Um, <laughs> he walks past and he hasn't sent me to HR for talking about genitals yet. So that's good. Um, <laughs> Cindy, thank you so much. This is Andrew Bowders. Really loved hearing this. It was wonderful. Wonderful to hear from somebody that's actually teaching. Yeah, this is great what got me past that fear of going all digital and it was partially there are two things one I take a risk every semester in every class I change something because otherwise you get stale and you get bored and it's just on repeat and nobody wants that and people are paying you to do this um two is that those failing students I was so heartbroken and what I had seen in this one student who I really adored was this incredible improvement and I thought if it can do that for him then I can help a lot of people. And it was scary, but man, it was so much. And, and the first time we tried to do courseware, it failed on us. We tried to, or it was pre-courseware. We tried to integrate it with our LMS and the state would not let me do it. And so we had this weird failure in the beginning of the semester. But once the students started using it, they said, this is incredible. And just hearing from them, and I surveyed them so much. I was like, is this okay? Should I do this again? And just seeing them come to class excited, that that made the risk worth it. Um, I think had they not been, I, I actually switched books in a different course, um, and it, it failed miserably um, this semester. And that's, that's always pretty awful when it happens. Um, yeah, we try things here that don't go well either, but we keep trying because we think mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you want to. If, if you don't take, if you, if you never try anything new, you're never going to innovate, you know, so you just kind of have to accept. And I tell the students, they'll be like, this is something new I'm doing this semester. And one of my comparative physiology class, I had them each pick a cryptid. So like vampires, werewolves, whatever. And then they had, they didn't know what it was for. And then they had to tell me about that animal's physiology every time we covered a system. <laughs> it was it's something that I was really scared about, but in the end, they loved it. They got so into talking about like chupacabras and <laughs> <laughs> um, and I see a question. I'm really glad that the guided notes are um, shown. I give them to the students and they love it because they, they use them to make study guides. And my real wish is actually, I've got two. <laughs> the other one is to somehow have the courseware stuff sync to their devices. Yep. So that when they're out and about and they don't have internet, they can be like, oh, here's the deck of stuff Cindy wants us to go through. 
Yeah, Th those are all those are all what we call back, you know, in the backlog. I know. <laughs> in the queue, and you know, I've started using that at work too. To say, hey, have you written this? Line? No, it's in the queue. <laughs> 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 Not due till July, and it's June. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. that's our, that wraps up our questions. Um, Maite, you want to conclude? Well, I will say what I said before that that um, when we talked to you, Cindy, when Emily and I talked to you, we thought it'd be a good idea to have you on, and I think it's it was more than I could have hoped for. This is exceptional. Yeah, I agree. I agree too, Cindy. Fantastic job. Thank you. It was a blast for me, and you know, I'm 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 the, I'm your biggest fan. Aww. Thank you so much. <laughs>